Hello everyone. Today I'll be explaining the good and bad things about adding Rust to a, a project. And uh, this is more of like experience that we had literally zero code in this demonstration. Um, so let's get started. Um, for those who are not familiar, Mercurial is a version control system that was started at around the same time as Git in uh, 2005. Uh, it's mostly written in Python. There has been C extensions since basically the beginning, because what would you do in 2005 for performance? Um, and now Rust, uh, with way too much code, and I'm responsible for half of it, um, it handles huge repositories with millions of files and revision and has a very powerful extension system, which I will have no time to talk about today. Um, so when thinking about introducing Rust inside Mercurial, what we did was trying to find exactly what to rewrite and why. Um, one of the main reasons why we wanted to introduce Rust was for performance reasons and because nobody wanted to write C anymore. Um, so we need to pick something that, goes, that needs to go fast or faster. Um, it needs to have a small enough scope so that it, it, it's something that can be reasonably well put into the mind of a single person. It needs to be well delimited. And by that, I mean that the inputs and the outputs need to be known in advance. And it doesn't need to do too much FFI use. So that's foreign function interface, that's the interface between two languages, uh, namely Python and Rust. Um, because FFI is very expensive, it's also pretty hard to do correctly. Um, so yeah. Um, very small background. In Mercurial, we use directed acyclic graphs. Doesn't really matter that you know about them. Um, it's a special kind of directed acyclic graph called Merkle trees, which is a nice cryptographic data structure that gives you that the, the children of uh, the hash of the children is defined by the hash of its parents. So you have very very nice uh, properties of this. Um, you are very familiar with Merkle trees if you've ever looked at your commit history, your commit log, and sometimes they look like this, <laughs> and sometimes uh, like this. Um, so some people have called this Guitar Hero. Um, <laughs> I have failed to find a similar joke with Mercurial in it. So yeah, that's what I'm going to be using. Um, but of course, if, if your history looks like this, you have to find algorithms that um, can handle those kind of complexities pretty well. Um, one of those is called the discovery algorithm. It's when you do a pull or a push, the first, one of the first things that it needs to do is to um, find the difference between the two repositories. That's called the discovery algorithm. Uh, it has constraints of network and latency and throughput. So um, depending on the situation, it might not do the exact same thing. Um, the exact algorithm, algorithm is very simple. It's like 250 lines of code. It's quite intricate, but it's not too much. Uh, and we rewrote this in Rust. It was up to three times faster. Uh, and never slower in, the, in any case. So that was good, very, success, very successful. It's like a pretty small scope of stuff. The other example I wanted to talk about was uh, something called the node map, which is an internal uh, data structure to Mercurial. Um, it's a way of finding data associated with a hash. So if you want to, say, view the contents of a commit, you will give it a hash or a par partial hash, and it has to find where that points to inside Mercurial. This is called the node map. And uh, we rewrote the node map in Rust, and it became 2,000 times faster. Woo. Uh, that's a bit of a clickbait, because we didn't just rewrite the node map in Rust. We also made it persistent. So most of the work is already persisted to disk, which explains why it's basically free now. Um, however, the persistent storage is not really as good if you do it in Python. That's why it's interesting to have it done in Rust, because Python, Python is actually really not that good at building uh, tree-like structures in memory efficiently, um, which is something that Rust can do uh, basically for free. Um, so that was very interesting. This basically disappeared from all of our uh, profiling. So that's nice. Same slide as before, with the bit of an asterisk. So when picking what to rewrite, we need all of those things, but you specifically need something that is well delimited. 
and that you need to refactor first if you need to do so. So I'm going to explain how I did not follow my own advice and um, why you should probably follow it. Um, the status command you're probably familiar with if you've used any version control system, Git has the same kind of similar command. Um, its purpose is to show what has changed since the last commit, uh, what files are modified, added, removed, whatever. Needs to compile all of the ignore patterns from the config, from the hdignore file, etc., into one big uh, regular expression, and it has to check every tracked file and uh, every untracked file. You need, it needs to show them by default. It looks like this. It's quite a simple and basic use uh, that is central to any uh, usage of a VCS. It makes use of a data structure called the dir state. Um, and the dir state is integral to any command that interacts with the working copy within Mercurial. So commit, diff, update, which moves in history, um, purge, files, whatever. Um, all of those commands use the dir state in some capacity. So it, it was apparent that it was one of the areas where Rust could uh, really improve the performance uh, story of Mercurial. Um, so a very rough timeline of uh, where I started. Um, which coincidentally was also the time I started learning Rust, which so that was a bit of a, a bit of too much at the same time. Um, I started with the parsing and packing of the dir state, basically the file, the bin binary format of the dir state, having a routine that can read this, put it in some kind of memory structure in Rust, and that can write it back to disk. Uh, this was pretty easy. Very, the format is really simple, um, but that that was fine. Um, then I moved on to the computation of the uh, rejects that needs to be used for uh, ignoring files. Um, and that was a bit harder because um, for multiple reasons. The first one was that the, the original Python implementation grew over time because Mercurial is, was 15 year old at the time, 17 now. Um, and the code was, wasn't as well delimited and, and nicely split as it could have been. So there should have been my first intuition to first start re reworking a bit the Python implementation. Um, also, the Rust default rejects system, I know that there isn't one in the standard library, but basically the rejects great, um, doesn't work the exact same way that the Python standard rejects uh, engine works. So there's different patterns that it can and cannot support, um, which was a bit of a hassle because we, need, we needed to find a way of falling back to the Python implementation if there was one of those um, around. So this was a little bit harder. Um, then when moving on to data structure itself of, of the dir state and the APIs that it exposes, for example, to get an entry of the dir state or to modify one of them, um, it was and I understood this much later in the, in, the, in, in the process because I didn't really talk to other call developers about it that, that knew something about this uh, code, is that um, everybody hated the API. Um, so I assumed naively that the, the API was built correctly and that it was, it was the right API because it was there for 15 years, so why wouldn't it be the right API, right? Um, and well, looking at it, it was very fragile um, and I re-implemented all of this in Rust, um, and, and, and we did gain some performance, and it was nice, but the, the actual code itself was very fragile, very complicated, and the semantics of the API weren't clear at all. And then, when moving on to the actual full status algorithm, um, this is where all of the shortcomings of the previous things that I've stated were really put into, uh, into light. Um, because the data structure wasn't good enough anymore for, for the performance we were looking for. Um, the, uh, the file format on disk wasn't good enough also. Um, any of the new semantics that we wanted to add so that uh, Mercurial can be a better tool, um, everything was wrong. So, so we had to actually restart, not from scratch, but to redo a lot of the work that we had done, um, which wasn't very good. But the takeaway from this is that you need to try to understand the constraints up front. When you're rewriting something, 
before even deciding to rewrite something, understanding what exactly the, the problem space for the thing that you're trying to rewrite is. Maybe the algorithm is actually really bad and just rewriting it in the same language could be just good enough. Um, and also, what is it trying to do and is the current solution good enough? Or does it actually need to change um, and it's just not just a rewrite? Um, refactor first. It helps you understand what the, the intricacies of the thing, like for example, just writing a doc string sometimes makes you understand what the um, implications of such a method are. So if, you're, um, if you have a method and you're like, oh yeah, I'm pretty sure I know what it does, and then you try to explain it to someone and you figure out that it's actually not that simple and that it has some subtleties that, that you've never thought about. Um, because the problem changes over time. Um, we have problems of scaling. The idea of a big repository in 2005 was really not the same as it is today uh, in, in, in 2022. So it's a moving target. And sometimes the solution that was the right solution for many reasons, maybe for just time constraints or whatever, um, was a good idea at the time. But it moves all, always. So you have to keep that in mind. And also, very good way, having a way of A-B testing the two implementations. So we have what's called the module policy. It's just something that allows us to choose which backend uh, we're using for Mercurial. So you can you test the pure Rust version, uh, the pure um, Python version, the version with some C inside, and the version with Rust inside. Um, and we can run the whole test suite with both to compare uh, and to to take all of the regression tests that we had um, and to see if the the new implementation carries over the bug fixes. Uh, from the old implementation. That's pretty important. So this was all work done from inside Python. It was Python is called, and then it calls into a Rust extension. Um, but we can attack the Python from the other side and uh, create an executable in Rust, a pure Rust executable, so that we can allow the user to have pure Rust fast paths if they choose to, um, to use that. Um, so it's called RHG, very inspired. And its constraints was that it needs to be transparent. People expect Mercurial to always just work. And we have broken backwards compatibility maybe twice on some very minor things. Trust me, I would love to break backwards compatibility, compatibility on many things that I really hate about the Mercurial CLI, but you know that's, that's how it is. So it needs to behave the same way as um, AG does. And it needs to fall back immediately if anything unsupported is, uh, is detected, which is um, unsupported commands, uh, CLI arguments, config, any other like extensions and that kind of stuff. If anything that it doesn't support is, uh, is detected, it needs to fall back to Python as fast as possible, which means that it needs to delay expensive computation. You cannot load a very expensive data structure or do some highly intensive file system work before you figure out that you can actually complete the whole thing, um, which actually the rewrite of the dir state, so the dir state version 2 that we did, um, uh, allowed us to do a lot of things that we couldn't do before be because it, uh, it would basically be instant to read the dir state nowadays uh, compared to pretty expensive uh, before that. So as I said, exact same behavior as Python. By that, we mean the error messages from the OS can be very different. So we have to find ways of translating um, and normalizing between the two implementations. So we started with uh, simple commands. I think the first one was um, hg root, which gives you the root of a repository and an error if there's no root, um, which is pretty simple in itself. Um, but you really early needed to do configuration parsing and requirements parsing. So requirements is like a, it's a file in Mercurial that tells you um, like the feature set of the current repository. So if your Mercurial implementation does not know about certain features, it can uh, just abort and say, I don't know how to handle this, uh, this repository. Um, so this was part of the things that it needs to uh, support. We've done the work incrementally um, in that you don't need to support 100% of what any command supports because even AGA root is, has some very complicated uh, config uh, like uh, flags 
um, because it's 17 year old software and people have added flags all over the place. So the idea was to focus on the fast path, on what is the most common thing that people are going to be using and that we can leverage to uh, give a better experience. Um, we've done the same thing. We've run this test suite with RG hiding as HG just to see, just to see if anything broke at all, um, which <laughs> it did, and then we fixed that. Um, and one of the other issues that I wanted to highlight throughout all of the problems that I've been talking about, like the status thing, RG, and many other things that I have, don't have time to talk about, was um, the kind of unique problem of having to deal with mixed encoding. Mixed encoding is a problem that you shouldn't have to deal with ever unless you're dealing with historical data. So Mercurial, like most version control systems, uh, you stores data of unknown origin. So it's, it's been put there in CVS or even pre-CVS days in the 70s or something, and nobody knows the encoding. Nobody will ever know the encoding. Maybe you could try to guess it, but still, that's a big problem, and uh, it could be added today. And now nobody, uh, nowadays, everybody uses UTF-8, but that's not always been the case, and still not the case everywhere. Um, since this historical data is never going to change, it's always going to be there somewhere. And so and if you want your, um, your history to be usable, you need to keep the historical data as it was at the time. Um, also, paths are not always UTF-8. That's something that I, I've seen a lot, uh, that people expect paths to be UTF-8, because most of the time they are. But for example, on most Unix systems, it's just anything that doesn't have an null byte in it, which is way wider than UTF-8. Um, so the, this, usually what we call cursed encoding, because nobody likes uh, handling mis mixed encoding. Um, really garbage in, garbage out. People put in the data, and we give it exactly byte, by, byte for byte. Um, this is one of the, what I'd like to call unknown unknowns. It's something that people don't budget for because they don't even know that the problem exists. I certainly one, was one of those people, so it, it's, it's certainly like, was a, kind of a surprise to have to figure understand that problem. I usually, when I need to, I need some help, I go to the Rust Discord, right? Uh, and someone is trying to help me with my problem, and I'm like, oh, I, I can't use string type because the string type is UTF-8 and it's going to eat my data. And people are like, why, sh why aren't you using the string type? Everything is UTF-8 anyway. Then I spent 10 minutes <laughs> explaining this. And it was like, just assume, <laughs> assume that I need this, please. <laughs> um, so it goes sometimes against the ecosystem because a lot of crates and a lot of tooling expects you to have nice UTF-8 data, which I completely understand why they would do that. But we're not the only problem space where that is an issue. Uh, actually, the maintainer of, for example, the rejects crate um, has a lot, done a lot of work with uh, byte strings because it's actually needed for uh, parsing arbitrary data. Um, I know that. I've been talking about Rust, and people like Rust because it also for performance. So I'm just going to show one slide with, yay, performance. OK. Um, <laughs> as you can see, some of it goes up, which is not good. Um, so I'm going to explain a little bit. Uh, the, these ones, the ones above, are the pure Python versions of an execution of age status on a huge repository, namely Mozilla Central, um, which has a, a 600,000 files or something, which is like much, much larger than the, the Linux kernel. Um, and as we've been re rewriting the dir state, the pure version of Python, which nobody uses, especially in those environments, uh, pure version, uh, pure Python version of uh, Mercurial started to go way up in terms of, uh, of wall time, which isn't very good. The C implementation, which is the one that you can see here um, in the orange one, uh, is also went a little bit up at the end, but was uh, more stable than the, than the Python version. And the rest of the curves are either the Rust, add, uh, um, the Rust extensions within Python or the pure Rust versions of the same execution. And by the end of it, um, this is on a machine without hyperthreading, without many cores. Um, so this is actually worse than it looks uh, because on a, a better machine, uh, you would have much better performance in this. So we're, we've gone from 
something that can give you three seconds of latency to get your feedback to something that can do maybe 40 milliseconds for the exact same results, which I think is pretty cool. Of course, as you can see, it's not all roses and everything because we made some other things slow. It turns out that they don't matter to anyone, but still, it, something to keep in mind if, if that's a use case that's important for you. And um, this is without some of the newest optimizations that we are currently uh, rolling in. Some of the things um, that you have to consider when introducing Rust inside of your project is that adopting Rust has also a human cost to it. It's not just a technical cost. There have been a lot of people that have talked about this uh, at, uh, at this event. Uh, so I'm just going to have one slide about it. Basically, it's more tooling, more code. More code is not good. Less code is good. Um, it's more tooling, fewer people with experience with the tooling in general. You're introducing a lot of complexity in your code base. Potentially code duplication. Because we want to still provide a pure Python path, path or a, a, a non-Rust path to uh, all of our users, um, it leads to a lot of code duplication, which is sometimes a good thing because you have multiple implementations of some, something and it can, it can show you that the API wasn't right if you rewrite it in Rust because you could do some black magic in Python, but that's not possible in Rust, for example. So that's sometimes a good thing, sometimes a bad thing. If you get a bug report, you need to fix it in two different implementations. I've done it, and it's not great, but you have to. Fewer reviewers are, com are comfortable so far reviewing Rust. Um, we've actually seen this move forward uh, within the past three years, I would say. Um, people were very hesitant to, to review Rust code uh, unless they were actively using Rust at work or something. Um, and nowadays, more people are very interested and they're like, oh, I want to start learning Rust, etc. And I'm like, yeah, please do. So like, so like you can merge my merge request, please. Um, so that's also quite something to consider. Like, it's basically the same as the first point fewer people that can understand um, what you're saying. Packaging is also more complicated. Um, for example, if the only thing you're interested in is, is, is making the Rust performance better, then you might, as we've seen maybe in the performance slide, you might neglect the other uh, implementations. And this is um, something that can impact, for example, the NetBSD people who still don't have Rust, or uh, not easily. Um, it, it's adding a new language, it's adding a compiled language uh, to Python, who is, already has a really difficult uh, packaging story. Um, so it's something that you have to also take in mind. Um, I still think that if I was to um, do it all over again, which um, I'm, I didn't create Mercurial, but if I were to build a new VCS right now, I would use Rust almost entirely, pretty sure. Um, in 2005, it was, I think, the right choice to pick Python or C. C was uh, obvious for performance reasons, but having the, the, the more high-level um, view of Python was very useful at the time. Um, it's a compiled language with little to no runtime. So if you're making a, a command, line, uh, command line tool, the startup time is crucial. Um, we have a test suite in Mercurial, a, a big end-to-end -end test suite, and a third of it is spent just booting Python, a third of the time, which is not good. Like, I, I need a faster loop. Um, and to give you an example, the status code that I talked about earlier, um, if you're, you have 600,000 files, you can do an AGIS status that gives you an answer in about 44 milliseconds on an eight core machine that with decent, decent power. 44 milliseconds gives you a Python interpreter that has just started. So it's on another class of uh, performance if you're in the, in the command line uh, tooling. Uh, VCS can do a lot of things in parallel. There's a ton of stuff in, in, in version control systems that, that benefit from being done in parallel. So Rust is quite good at this. Um, in, the status algorithm, everything is pretty much done in parallel. Uh, if you update, so that's what you make all checkout in Git. Uh, so if you go to another version of the history, you need to update all of your files and everything. This can be done in, mostly in parallel. Uh, some of the network stuff can be done in parallel, which is all very good. 
Um, I think one of the best things about Rust, aside from the performance from my point of view, and I think for, from the point of view of a lot of people in this room, um, that you can embed very strong semantics within the type system. You can enforce uh, things that are fun uh, at a functional level, and the compiler will uh, uphold those, um, those things for you. And for example, using type states for state machines, uh, if, if you haven't read the excellent blog post about it, it's, it's very easy to find uh, nowadays because it's very popular. But um, there's a ton of stuff. Whenever I go back to Python or any other language that doesn't have algebraic types, for example, I'm just super sad. Um, it is quite portable, not as portable as C or, or Python, but it's, it's quite portable, which is a nice story, like the, the Windows packaging story is not, not harder than the Linux one for our particular case. Um, Windows implementation story, that's another affair. But. And all of the other nice things about Rust that um, is not specific to version control systems. Um, it's rewriting the entire thing uh, in Rust in Mercurial is a big step because it breaks backwards compatibility in a lot of ways. It's a ton of work and it's probably not feasible in, sh in the short term. Um, but new tooling, uh, can be done in Rust, and we've shown and proved ourselves that uh, Rust is a, an amazing fit. Uh, even with all of the issues that I've mentioned and all of the things that make it a bit harder, the learning curve, etc., cetera, um, it makes it really worth it um, for a, a version control system. I hope some of it was enlightening for you. Um, I'd like to thank you for staying and not falling asleep too much. Uh, <laughs> And uh, thank you.